Welcome to GFA on the ball. Today we have with us technical director, Mr. Jerry Alexis, who will be giving us an insight as to what's going on with some of the programs that he has on stream with football development in Grenada on a whole. Jerry, thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. me. Richard, thanks for having me. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here and it's also a pleasure to share with, you know, the football fraternity, you know, some of the plans that we have. I mean, even though some of them are not up and running as yet, but some of we have for the near future. Thank you so much for joining me as well. But before we dive off as to what is really going on football wise, you now give people a sense as to who is Jerry Alexis. Because before Jerry Alexis was technical director of GFA, he was a coach of uh, St. John Sports yeah. and also very a part of GFB Council as well. So tell us more about Jerry Alexis. Oh, in a nutshell, you know, not much. Um, <laughs> Jerry Alexis, as you, all, as you rightly said, I've been the coach of St. John Sports team for a few years. We, you know, we would have built the team um, to, to have a good reputable, uh, reputable reputation now over the past few years. Mm -hmm. As you know, St. John Sports is one of the teams that actually is in the top four of competition for the past three, four years, four, five years. You know, and, and counting. I uh, added to that, I've been around national football from since 2007 to now. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it be as assistant coach, whether it be as fitness trainer, you know, physiotherapy, you know, for national teams. Uh, since I came back from Cuba in 2006, I got right into the um, to the meat of this and I've been around the national team from since then to, you know, to now. Um, before coming here, I was mm -hmm. curriculum development officer at the Ministry of, of Education. and. And, you know, the opportunity arise to, to help people out the game of, of football within our country. And I see no reason why, you know, hey, Jerry, why not jump on it? If you can have a make an impact, you know, from mm -hmm. that standpoint, uh, let's do it. And yeah, my today, technical director. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure having you on board. Yeah. So tell us, what is what is it as technical director are you bringing on the table? Uh, well, I think one of, the, one of the first things that we have to look at is, is the game and, and the development of the game. Mm -hmm. and I, when I speak to the game, I speak of the development, sorry, I speak to the holistic development. Of the game. Mm -hmm. I think far too long in Grenada. I mean, we have this concept that sports and, and football is for for the quote unquote, you know, persons that are slow in school, mm -hmm. and and we don't need an intelligent person to to play sport. And and that's one of the things that I think we have to start to change. We have to change the perception and the mindset of the people that surround the game to let them know that sports is not for quote unquote the slow person, but school, sports is for an intelligent person. Because in order for you to understand the tactics that the coach is going to employ, you must have a brain in your head to understand, to understand that first, and then also to to execute it. Um, if you look at the, the bigger countries and the world and whole, you know, the most of them to tell you that sports and education go hand in hand. Sure. And I think that's one of the things that we definitely have to marry. We have to make sure that our players now are not just playing football, but are also educating themselves. Because not every player is going to be a professional player. You know, mm -hmm. there are scholarship opportunities. That can present itself, so that at least these players, and if they cannot make it professionally, they can actually get outside there, have make a scholarship, get a scholarship, sorry, and make a, a livelihood for themselves and, and the family. So I think if that's one of the first things that we have to look at. I also believe that we need to set certain standards between the football. Um, mm -hmm. Far too long, we operate on little or no standards, and we don't what people are comfortable. And I think one of the reasons for that is that we don't see football as a business. We don't treat it to the, with the sort of professionalism that it ought to be treated with. I think these are some of the things that we have to start to change. We have to change the mindset and the perception of the, of the people. One last thing, you know, before we move on to the next topic, I think that, you know, even requirement for coaching, mm -hmm. somebody that is going to coach a national team, what sort of requirements they ought to have in order to be part of that. And, and we, we, in the past, we basically didn't have any of this much. And now we have to try to start to put all these things in place because if you're applying for a coaching job, it's just as if you have to have some football certification. Okay. You know, it's just as if you're applying for a job to be a, uh, should I say, a accountant or a banker, or even a teacher. There are certain requirements that you have to meet in order to be this, to fill this position. And I see why football should be an exception. It shouldn't be any exception for football. I mean, the same thing that applies to any other profession, it should be applied for coaching also. Okay, talking about coaching education, I know that's something that you're very fond of because you yourself just, not just, but recently completed, um, at the training trainer program, you are training yourself with that. What is it that you have in place right now for some of our coaches that is, you know, presenting themselves out there to the different teams, even our national team as well? Oh, well, as I rightly said, yeah, me and myself, not just myself, but we have a few other persons, mm -hmm. you know, Jay Crane, who's one, um, Norris Wilson, Roderick Griffith, you know, all these persons will update the training trainer program. Mm -hmm. I think Jake and I, Jay Crane and I, we'd have gone a little bit more than them to actually go and to do the, 
the FIFA CEC Project Educator School St. Croix. last year. The second part of it was supposed to be in Grenada this year. I mean, as you know, it is COVID will yes. come and all this have to go on at the back burner. But adding to that, um, as you speak now in terms of culture education, uh, CONCACAF basically is, is, is in conversation with all, all MAs in the region to actually set up, for MAs to set up their own culture education department. And mm -hmm. that's one thing that we would have jumped on for with Grenada. Um, we are now in the process of working with CONCACAF to develop our own coaching manual. Mm -hmm. Because what CONCACAF is telling us is that they don't need to come to our countries anymore because okay. we have facilitators within our country to sort of execute this training, this, I'm sorry, this coaching program. So now they are working along with us. I'm working there together with um, a few of our instructors. We have Mr. Vinglin, who's a former technical director. He is the one that is directly supervising, supervising us, sorry. Mm. And, and giving us guidance as to how we go about developing our own coaching manual, but then before the D license, C license, B license. So pretty soon we will be we will be conducting our own our own courses here and we don't need CONCACAF to come and tell us what to do for our courses. It will be a GFV, C license, D license, B license. And all these will be guided by CONCACAF curriculum or or whatsoever other curriculum we choose to use as our guides to develop our our program. So pretty soon in the near future, as I say, uh, we're going to have more coaches on board, more educated coaches on board. I honestly believe that the more educate, um, educated coaches we have or the more qualified coaches we have, the better environment we're going to we're going to produce. Obviously, once you have a better environment, you're going to produce better players. Um, adding to that, um, as I said, I'm operating as a mentee to that same program that is going on um, under the you know, under the former technical director, Mindy, who's a mentor. So technically what I'm saying is that CONCACAF eventually is going to use me as one of the person maybe within the region to be mm -hmm. able to conduct some of this stuff. And added to that, FIFA would have just jumped on board and FIFA is doing the same thing. So J. Crenny and I, we are also involved in a program with FIFA. As a matter of fact, J. Crenny has a meeting tomorrow, which is the 22nd, and I have a meeting on the 25th, there about, of this week, you know, um, and both working with FIFA where we are mentees so same coach education program I mean with the intention in the near future so that Jay Crenny could be one of the FIFA um, coach educators and like by myself could be one of the FIFA coach educators you know being in mind that what we would have done in our course I said. Okay so let's dive a little bit and talk about grassroots because it seems like most MAs we know across the, the region grassroots is something that suffers a bit and we here at the GFA we're trying to Know, educate people more on grassroots. What are the plans for grassroots? Oh, well, grassroots to start with, I think I think one of the biggest challenges we have with grassroots is understanding first what is grassroots. Mm -hmm. I think grassroots is any form of development football. So most people think grassroots has to be with kids. But if you're 15, 16 and they never played the game, you have to go into a grassroots program because okay. you're just starting. That's and true. that's what grassroots means, initial, initial um, program. I think one of the biggest challenges in Grenada is that most of most people think that the ME quote unquote has to have a grassroots program. I think what we ought to do and what we're going to be doing in the near future is that we, we're going to be supporting the existing programs that exist. Because there are many people that are conducting grassroots, private academies, private schools, you know. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest challenges they have is that sometimes they cannot sustain it because they are not getting the support they ought to get from, from, the, football, um, from the football association. So a simple thing as balls. I mean, if I'm running a grassroots program, a personal grassroots program, and I'm not charging because you know how football is in Grenada. How do I sustain that? How do I maintain True. that? I think that's one of the challenges we have. So now the FA is going to step in, as I said. We should be having a meeting pretty soon, I think, hopefully next month, with all the grassroots centers, all the persons that are running grassroots, and also all the persons who intend to set up grassroots within the, um, within the communities because I know of my head of five persons that would have called me and expressed interest in setting up grassroots within their communities. And then these people, we're going to involve them also. We're going to support their program. We're going to, whether it be ball, we have to quantify what we give them, whether it be mm -hmm. balls, cones, beeps, you know, and sort of advise them and say, how oh, we think it should run. Adding to that, what we're going to do as an association is that from these centers or these little grassroots programs that are running all over the place, we're definitely going to have people looking at it. So we're going mm -hmm. to start identifying talent. Okay. When we identify talent, now we can bring them out to a national grassroots program whereby we have some of the better persons working with these persons now to actually develop these people, persons. And, and added to that, I mean, with, with all, the, all the grassroots programs that are going to be running as an association, we're going to definitely be organizing festivals and stuff, so, which is going to make it also easier for us to identify the talent within the when we have the festival program. So, as I said, grassroots definitely is going to come on stream. Um, a lot of this would have, was supposed to happen already, but you know, COVID lockdown, mm 
-hmm. and then we had issues with getting quote unquote getting everybody right back to play even though we are still we are still right team having challenges you know for for that um and added to that what we're going to do is that once we have the grassroots up and running uh, bruce and i would have sat already and discussed it and we talked about looking at you know under nine under eleven on the certain competition you know not the 13 being the highest age, highest age where we're going to play 9v9 and the under 13 and then break the numbers down as we go down to the um, to the lower age. So, so that is some of the things that we're looking for grassroots. Um, and I and I don't believe at that age we have to also remember that it's fun at the grassroots level is fun. So the person that's going to be working with the people, with the players at that level have to also understand that, that it's not about much about competing, mm -hmm. but it's about fun and development. <laughs> that is true. Okay, so let's just move on to, I know what is one of the things that you have set out of right now is the elite program. Tell us more about this elite program. Oh, the elite program. <clears throat> I, I, I honestly always had a problem with, with players have to go to work. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the context in Grenada that most of our players, quote unquote, we, we know football sports, we get some of the slower ones. And quote unquote, they get the lower end jobs in society. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no secret. You know, we cannot hide it. Most of our players, uh, they go to construction, come and have to be tired. And then eventually, they have, we are asking them not to come and give 100% when they would have worked a normal 8 to 4. You know, I, I don't think it's fair. So, <clears throat> what had happened is that myself and Bruce, we sat down, we discussed it, and we decided to approach the government. <clears throat> and and we would have looked at what the Cricket Association is doing with the Cricket Elite Program. And, and I saw Bruce, I said, Bruce, why we don't do that? And, and Bruce said, yeah, that's a good idea, let's look at it. And actually what happened, we would have reached out to the Ministry of Youth and Sports. Uh, the peers at the peers there, Mr. Kilbert, Norman Kilbert, like the idea. And we put things in place. We, we wrote a proposal, we wrote an MOU, and we would have submit all the schedules, what we're going to do in the program, you know, how we're going to execute it and everything, what the GFA is going to bring to the program also. Mm -hmm. And, and they, you know, they like the idea. So we basically, you know, are waiting. We should be rolling out that program, I think, next month, whereby we have about 30 persons on that program that are just going to be training football in the morning, maybe within 8 to 10, there about, and then on the afternoon session, they do personal development session and community service. The idea behind that they're going to be operating like the manage whereby they receive a stipend at the end of the month so they no longer have to go to a normal normally to job where they might be eight to four sorry job where they're making little or no money mm -hmm. however they come straight to, to us and we take care of them you know all the needs added uh, all the needs um from the gfa standpoint we we plan to outfit them and outfit them properly we, we are looking at giving every player in the program a football boots sneakers three sets of uniforms you know backpack because if it's an elite program, it has to feel like yeah, an elite program. You can't say an elite program, <laughs> and they have to buy their own shoes or, or stuff like that. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Even T-shirts to come to the program for home, so that they can be identified on the street that this person is actually going to that, you know, to that program. So I mean, we I want to thank the government, you know, for getting on board with that program. I think it's going to do wonders, you know, wonders for us because we would have selected thirty percent between the age of nineteen to 20, 26 there about mm -hmm. the program. What we wanted the intention is to run the program for five years and why and we think while you're within that program within five years you should be able to at least make that national get onto that a national team not so job to, you'll be able to get a scholarship to go to another country or you can get a professional contract so that's the aim behind that program is is going to well organized well put together and we're going to have persons from outside coming to speak to the speak to the participants from time to time and they're going to get some of the better training on the island Okay, would it be having an academic set up as well? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, personal development, academic component to mm -hmm. it. Um, we are also looking to see if, you know, some of the students that don't even have CXC subject, mm -hmm. how we can help them, you know, to actually do some of the subjects to develop themselves. Because as I said, I mean, in the initial conversation, I said we have to look at the game and develop the game holistically. I mean, academic. <laughs> Should I say education mm -hmm. is part of me? I'm coming from a teaching background. Okay. I would have worked with, at the Ministry of Education prior to coming here. So I am... I mean, I, I'm a sucker <laughs> for education, if I should say that. You know, I, I want to make sure that the people that we put outside, they are well educated. Mm -hmm. And for simple reasons, Nisha, because you get out there, you play well, the first thing the media push the mic in front of your face. That is true. You have to speak, you know. That is true. How do you speak? Yes. Okay, well, I'm the best player on the pitch. <laughs> then how do I speak to the media? How do I, you know, and so on. Yes. So we have to make sure that we, we well educate our players, our sports persons going forward. And, and we have to change the concept and, and the perception we have of, of sports people in Grenada. Oh my God, there's so much I'm getting from you right about yeah. now. And I don't want to be too long with you, but our senior men team, they 
in preparation for World Cup qualifiers and also the Gold Cup, CONCACAF Gold Cup. How is that going? Um, senior men team, well, we we start the training. We um, at the at the moment, I, I am the one taking the session for the senior national team. We are in, with the, in the absence of a head coach. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to rectify that. As a matter of fact, just to speak to head coach a bit, we we had a sh we had just shortlisted fourteen persons mm -hmm. um, for for the for the position. Uh, we gonna we have a committee set up. We have a number of names looking at the at the at the at the um, names that are, that we shortlisted. And these persons on the committee is going to select three persons, hopefully by Wednesday of this week, so that we can interview you know, these, these three persons for the position of, of head coach. The preparation thus far, you know, um, is going pretty well. We we were supposed to play in this October window and November window, but as, as you know, um, CONCACAF would have cancelled both windows and mm -hmm. they were going to play all the game come next year, March, all the qualifiers next year, March. However, we're not going to stop our preparation because I think we need to develop our local players. We need to get more local players back onto our national team. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we have the talent here. I think we they are raw. It's like that money you find in the dirt, and you have to make sure you cut it. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things that we have to definitely do with our our local players now. There, there are certain deficiencies that they have, and I would have identified a lot of them already, and then I would have spoke to the players that are in the training at the moment. And a lot of them would have accepted, hey, you know what, this is also some of our deficiency and they definitely have to work on it mm -hmm. if we have to move forward. So the team, as I say, is going to continue in training. We're not going to stop until March next year. Once a new coach, once we hire a head coach and he comes in and then Jerry Alexis is going to step aside because <laughs> that is not my role, you know, to coach the yes. team. But in the interim, I'm just acting there, you know, trying to help the, the guys to make sure that they, they stay in shape and, and work on the technical ability. You speak of a community in place for Hiring the head coach, you mind sharing the members of the committee? Well, it's it made up of a couple of executive members and mm -hmm. myself as a, as a technical director. Okay. Yes. Is there anything else you wish to share with us? Um, well, there are some other things happening. Um, as you know, we we speak to youth development. I think mm -hmm. that's something that we have to look at. I I know from the last two U20, U20 um, FIFA, com I'm sorry, CONCACAF competition, we did give good showing of ourselves. However, I think maybe our preparation was not enough. As you know, in February of this year, we, we got knocked out of the group mm -hmm. to Dominican Republic in the 86 minute of the game because Dominican Republic would have beat us 1-0. Uh, had we had drawn the game or win the game, then we'd have been going on to the, next, to the next stage. But I think we did well with our youth teams and that's something that we definitely have to build on. So what we're going to be doing now is that the next U20 competition is going to be in 2022. So definitely we're going to be training from January 2021 in preparation for that. So we're not going to be like two months, three months preparation before we're that's going good. to be competition. And that's what we're going to be doing with the U17 teams also because this competition is every two years. Okay. So it doesn't make sense that you come up for competition and then it's a two year span and you're, you're just calling the guys six months, four months before. No, we, we have to make sure we develop these, these, um, these youth players proper with a two year cycle. So. Even in the presentation I did with CONCACAF this morning, that's one of the things that I would like to them, especially for youth football. We need to develop a two-year cycle so that they will get that all-round training and in preparation for, for this competition. So that's something that we, we definitely have to look at. So most of the players that are born in the year 2003, 4, and 5, come January 2021, we'll be engaging them, you know, so that at least we can start preparation for 2022 U20. And we are going to, U17s are actually preparing now. Mm -hmm for their, their qualifiers, which is going to start in the latter, the last quarter, sorry, of this year. U17 male and female, they are also in preparation. So once these U17 are over, then we actually roll into the next U17 one time. We look for the age group, the appropriate age group, and roll into the U17s one time. We don't want to stop with the youth, with the youth program because I think the youths are the future. We have good, good as I say, good talent here, and we have to, um, we have to develop, we have to develop that. Okay, so besides the U20 competition, any youth tournaments on the, on the agenda in them soon? You mean locally or Lo in not international? International. Con locally, mm -hmm. one, and the Congo FIFA. Okay, well, I know Mr. Swan, um, Mr. Swan would have sent out the, um, the, the list of competition that we hope to do in yes. the latter part of the year. I know the U15 is one that we, yeah. we plan to restart. Um, mm -hmm. We had, I can't remember giving the exact number off my head how much we had before the lockdown, mm -hmm. but we had quite a few, but I think nine teams would have would have accept the call to continue the competition. Mm -hmm. So these nine teams are actually going to play against each other and then the top four goes into semifinals and finals. 
that's for the EU 15. I know we're also going to be doing the EU 19, which we started in November, okay. November of this year. So the EU 15 and the EU 19, definitely, the latter part of this year, they're going to be, they're going to be rolling out also. Okay, and CONCACAF? Uh, at CONCACAF level, as I said, the EU 17, they are in preparation. Both EU 17 okay. teams are in preparation. Okay. And they will be played in the last quarter, meaning the last quarter runs from October to December of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, CONCACAF has not specified a date as to when the competition is, but I, I am... I am presuming that hopefully it should be November, December of, um, of 2020. Um, the boys is also going to continue in the first quarter of 2021, but I know the girls are going to be in that last quarter, but the boys is going to be in last quarter into the first quarter of 2021. Okay, thank yeah. you very much, Jerry. Yeah. It's a lot, a lot, a lot to take in, and we appreciate your time and for being here with us. So there you have it, guys, on the ball with Jerry Alexis. Thank you very much for viewing. See you next time. No.